We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today to learn more of your word, your law, your precepts. We pray that you would touch every heart, open every mind, every spirit to receive your word. I thank you, Lord, for these who have not turned away their heart from hearing the law, and that uh, you would touch everyone here and develop them into what you want them to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are no longer in No Fear February. Um, the direction for this month that, pa- that God has given Pastor is we are now going from fear to favor. Um, and when I, when I asked for a little bit more clarification about like what, what exactly uh, is meant by that, um, I, I, I tested, texted Pastor about that, and he, and he responded with, uh, I'd like to really focus on the favor of God, the benefits of Christian living, the power of unity, the rewards of faithfulness, the strength of fellowship, power in prayer, singleness of mind and fasting, things like this. A very positive month showing what we, we can expect by being his. Um, so with that, I, I stand here today in submission to pastor and the vision that God ha- has given him. Uh, and I uh, w- want to deliver a message titled, In My Father's House. Um, if you could put this slide up there. Oh, it's already up there. Perfect. Um, I don't know if my remote's going to work. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so we're going to start off with uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, there we go. Now, now my slides finally caught up on my tablet. There we go. So the we're going to start with Luke uh, chapter 15, reading through uh, verses 11 through 32. I have it in the ESV, so it's going to be a little slightly different than if you're following along in the King James. Um, I just did this for ease of reading through this the lesson text. Um, starting in verse 11, and he said, uh, "There was a woman who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me.'" And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had took, uh, all that he had, and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property on reckless living. He was, quote unquote, living it up. Um, in, <laughs> I'm not going to go into all the things that he was doing because the Bible doesn't expound on that, but. Uh, riotous living is the way that the King James describes uh, his lifestyle. Um, he was going and doing some, possibly doing drugs, sleeping around, like doing stuff like that. He was going and quote unquote living it up. Um, and so w- one thing is he, he basically took this, uh, the inheritance of his father and went and just spent it on lavish lifestyle. He might have been driving down the road in a Bugatti. Um, of the day, um, like he—I I don't know what what all he was doing, but he—he he was basically spending all of that money foolishly, spending it on pleasures for himself. Um, and w- w- one thing that um, sin promises us is that, uh, yeah, like, oh yeah, the, the initial feeling that you feel at the beginning, like r- right when you start dabbling into sin, is like, man, it's going to be this good forever. Could just come on, come and enjoy yourself because you're like it's going to be like this forever. But that's simply just not the case. Um, the, the the pleasures of sin they, they only last for a season, and um, like I, I, actually, if, if you study the brain, uh, dopamine is the the chemical that is rele- is released when you go through a pleasurable experience. And um, when you like, like like the more often, let's just use like. Doing doing pot, for instance, uh, the the first time that you do it, there's a very high dopamine spike in your brain. But then after that, it goes down to pr- pr- practically producing no dopamine for for your period of time to compensate for that high. And then it's just like it it starts this cycle of uh, where it's just like it it's never going to be as strong as that first one. And it's just like continually like trying to get back to that first high, um, which is what seeking after pro- after pleasure. It's, it's great at first, but then over time, it just becomes more and more less fulfilling, or less and less fulfilling. That, I think that's the best way to put it. <laughs> um, but, like, like uh, and, and, and that's just how God wired our brains, is um, sin, it, it's pleasurable for a season, but after that, it will leave you in a place feeling empty and broken. Um, and... Uh, we're going to move on to in the story th- uh, to verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be 
in need. And this is exactly what was happening in his life. He had went and spent it all on a lavish lifestyle, going in, quote unquote, living it up. And uh, living a life full of, I just want to please myself. And in verse 15, and he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. Oh, and actually, in verse 14, there, there's a, a key point that I'm going to come back to later, is that there was a famine in the land. Um, just remember that, that, that point. Verse 15, and he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Here he came to a revelation that it is better in my father's house. He came to that revelation. And if every backslider would come to that same revelation, the house of God would be filled. And as I was praying uh, and, and studying for this lesson, God's like, all right, we're going to have a prayer service in the middle of the reading of the lesson text. So right now, I, I just want us all to pray for all the backsiders to come to that same revelation of the goodness of God and that it is better in the house of God than where I'm at right now. So I'll, l let's just all pray right now, Lord. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give all the backsliders and all the sinners a fresh revelation of, the, of your goodness, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would give them that revelation that it is better in the house of God than out in the world, Lord Jesus. That your goodness is so great, Lord Jesus. That you are almighty God. You own the cattle on a thousand hills, Lord Jesus. And Truly, in your house, there are pleasures forevermore, Lord Jesus. Give them that revelation, Lord. Draw them back to your house, Lord Jesus. Draw them back to the body of God, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we receive them back, Lord, with open arms like you did. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I truly believe that in the last days, there will be many black backsliders that come back to Jesus. And we need to be ready and waiting for them to receive them with open arms. Moving on, uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 18 and 19 uh, the, the prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, or say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Bishop talked a little bit about this last week, the, this cycle of, oh, I messed up, so now I have to like inflict self-punishment for a while to become worthy of forgiveness. And then after you go through a season of self-punishment, then it's like, okay, now, now I feel worthy to even ask for forgiveness. And, 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 and then it's like, okay, now that I have uh, forgiveness, now I'm going to just walk in right standing with God. And then, oh, I messed up again. Now I got to go through this cycle all over again. And that's not the way God designed it to be. That <clears throat> we, we, we serve a, a loving father. And Right, right here, what the, what the prodigal son was doing is he was going through this cycle. He's just like, oh, I, I need to even discredit my own title as being a son of my father. And I was like, oh, I messed up so bad. I, I can't even be considered your son anymore. Um, and I want to let you in on a secret. There is no sin that is too big that Calvary cannot cover. There is no sin that is too big that Calvary cannot cover. The blood of Jesus, it is sufficient for any and every sin. Because to God, sin is sin. A small white lie is the same. Uh, yes, there are different punishments here on earth and uh, like, like consequences for that. But to God, it's one sin is no different than any other. Um, and God, he is a merciful God. He is a gracious father. And uh, I, I really love the way that um, Jesus portrayed the, the, the father in this scenario. Because the father in this parable is symbolic of God Almighty, the, the Father. And uh, in verse 20, it starts talking about, the, um, uh, I'll just read it. And he, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring, qu bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I want to point out again that earlier in this story, there was a famine in the land. Yet, there was a fatted calf in the father's house. There was a famine in the land, and yet there was still a fatted calf in the father's house. And the, the same, the reason, like, I love this story. Because it, even today, if you feel famine, and, 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 you've, uh, and, and, and this, this message is not just for the people here. This is a, a message for, the, for everyone in Fairbanks in this region. That if you feel, are feeling famine, it is time to get back to the house of God. It is time to get back where the, the fatted calves are stored. Because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And where does he store them? He stores them in the house of God. That's where God resides. And it's like, if you want that, that provision, you want that, that favor, it's time to return to the house of God. Fairbanks, it is time to return to the house of God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There was famine in the land, yet there was still a fatted calf in the father's house. Mm. So that was the one son up until this point. But there's actually two sons in this story. And so we learned a valuable lesson from the, the younger son not to just turn, like, like take this this inheritance, which is symbolic of, of the grace and the favor of God, and go and just spend it on a lavish lifestyle or uh, living for a life full of just pleasure and trying to please yourself. And now, now from here on, it's talking about the other son. And there's, a, there's a, another lesson to be learned from the older son in this, in this scenario. In verse 25, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and, he, uh, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he, and he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. Everyone say, uh-oh. Somebody's in trouble. <laughs> and then verse 29. And he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And this is the end of the parable that Jesus taught. It's like su such great rejoicing when, when just one person comes back to God. This is what happens in heaven. There's great rejoicing all across heaven when just one sinner comes to repentance and turns back to God. And the parable of the, uh, of the prodigal son is, is just a really beautiful picture of how God relates to us. When, like, like oh yeah, like, like some people turn their back on God and go live for themselves for a while, but it's like, you know what, this is not what it was promised to be. And then they turn their back and start going back to Jesus, and he's like, oh, I see them coming from a far way off. I'm going to go and run to meet them with open arms, because that's what Jesus does. When, when, when people mess up, and 
all of us do this at, at, at times. We all are human and we mess up. And she's like, nope, I'm going to turn back to Jesus. And he's always there with open arms waiting to, for us to just be in, eh, embalmed in his embrace. This is what, what Jesus and, and, and how God operates. Jesus once told a, a parable about how um, some, some workers were working just for one hour in, um, in, in the field, and then other workers were working the entire day in the field. And then at, at, at the time to pay the, the day's wages, at the end of the day, every single worker got the exact same pay. And uh, some, of the, like, some of the workers that had worked all day they came in and complained to the, the, the owner of that field, and they were like, why is it that we worked all this time, and they just worked for a very short period of time, and they, we get the same pay? Like, that's not fair. And, uh, like, at, at the end of it, it's just like, no, every, like, I, I, I basically can give out uh, my pay as I, uh, as I see fit, and then... Um, like, I, as I was studying for this lesson, it was just like, I was thinking about it, like, wh what is the reward for all the labor that we put into the kingdom? Eternal life, right? Can you get 1.5 times eternity? <laughs> you can't. 1.5 times eternity equals eternity. You, you, you can't, at least if I'm doing my math correctly, I, I might be a little off, but <laughs> you, you can't get, oh, can I get two eternities, please? Like, no. <laughs> Like, at the end of the day, we all, like, the same reward is for every single person. It, like, that, that same reward of eternal life. So we, we can't say, like, oh, I want more eternity than someone else because I worked harder. Like, no, that, that's not how this works. And in the end time revival, when there are backsliders coming back to God or people that had never lived for God their entire life and they're maybe in their 80s and they finally come to God, it's just like, man, I lived my whole life serving God. Like, what, like. The valuable lesson here is to receive them with open arms, just like the Father did, because that's what we need to do when they come back and like treat everyone with the same love that Jesus had. This is what we are called to do. And uh, so to kind of summarize some take-home points, if you will, from, from this parable, um, th th this parable is speaking to two types of people. First, it's, it's speaking to the lost and to the backsliders and saying, it's time to come back to your father's house. There's a fatted calf waiting for you in the father's house. God is waiting for you to come back and, and, and to come to that revelation that God is good and that it's so much better living for God in, in his house with his believers. It is so much better. So it, this parable speaks to the lost and it also speaks to the saints. When they come back, you need to love them. When they come back, you need to love them. You need to receive them with open arms and not get, have the, the attitude and the mindset of, I worked so hard, I worked harder than them, I was more faithful. Anytime that there's comparison like that, there's probably some traces of pride, which God absolutely despises. It's the number one thing that God hates is pride. Um, and almost always, if there is comparison between person and person, pride is involved in some way, form, or fashion. Um, so, just something to avoid, uh, comparison. So, uh, as children of God, we have the right to go boldly before his throne. Um, we do not have to say, say to God, I'm no longer worthy to be called your child, like the prodigal son did. Um, and I actually have a question here for, if you're a parent, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, we have quite a few parents here. Um, and how many of you who just raised your hand would disown your children if they messed up too badly? Okay, we got one hand in the back. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's always one. No. <laughs> it's like I, maybe I need to re redirect the, this message. No. Um, but it, so, n n no parent here, which everyone here is human, and no human parent here would disown their child if they messed up too badly. And God, which is, he is perfect, 
he is e- even more capable and more willing to accept us in when we mess up because that, that's just how he operates. And in the same way that, that you love your children and, and you wouldn't kick them out of your house if they messed up, you will correct them, you will discipline them, but it, it's your love for, for them that will keep them in the house. But if they decide to go and, go and run off on their own, that's their decision. But God's love, it's like it, it like covers us. And, and it helps us, and it allows us to make mistakes, and like, okay, I made a mistake, I'm going to get back up, I'm going to learn from my mistake, and I'm going to just keep, keep driving on. Um, and yeah, I know for me, growing up, I, uh, I was one of those kids that, I was a problem child, believe it or not. <laughs> Some of y'all might not see, believe that, but um, I learned, I, I think I, I got really good at math because of my dad. Um, there, was, there was one time that he was like, okay, you've been bad every single day. I'll, I'll make you a deal. I'm going to spank you two, uh, like, like, I think he started out, out at one. He said, I'm going to spank you one time today. If you're bad tomorrow, I'm going to spank you two times. And it's going to double every single day until you're not bad. I'm like, okay. And I got up to 32, and then <laughs> that's like eight days or whatever. <laughs> I, it, it took me a while to be, figure out, like, okay, 32 times 32 well, times 2 is 64. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> I was like, no, that's no. Um, and I finally figured out, and I guess how to do math or how to be obedient is rather. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just like, yes, like, w- there are punishments, but in, like, m- Every time, he's like, I'm doing this because I love you. And I was like, I hate hearing that. I do not want to hear that. But, like, the, a, a loving father will discipline their children. And, and, and God's the same way. Um, and j- just because there's grace present doesn't mean that there isn't going to be discipline present for bad behavior. Um, so j- just keep that in mind. Um, I don't know. I have no idea where I'm at in my notes anymore. Let me give you a second. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, as children, we can come boldly before his throne and not have to fear that we're just going to be cast out and be rejected by him because he is a loving father. Um, and w- one point that I, I find re- really uh, reassuring and comforting is that at no point was the prodigal son referred by his father as something other than his son. He was only mentioned as something other than son by himself. He was like, uh, he said about himself, I am not worthy to be the son. Just please call me servant instead. But that's not how God works. In this parable, we see God, he was showing how he receives someone that is ready to come back to daddy's house. He, He receives them with open arms. And then uh, w- one point that I, w- that I wanted to make is that all of humanity, in a physical sense, is a, is a child of God. All of humanity. Um, we're going to go to the, the passage in Luke. Uh, at, at the end of Luke chapter 3, this is uh, the genealogy of Jesus, and it starts at Jesus, goes all the way, goes through David, goes through Abraham, goes through Noah, goes all the way back to not Adam, because that's not where the, where, where, where the genealogy is, uh, starts. It says um, in 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam was referred to the son of God, and all of humanity has came from him. So all of humanity, the entire human race, are physically children of God. There is a difference between being a spiritual child of God and a physical child of God. But in a physical sense, we are all children of God. Why? Because we were made in his image. Like it talks about in Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And as a, as a child of a father, you take on the nature of your father. And um, for me, my biological or my earthly father is very logical in his thinking. He's, he's very artistic. He very extreme attention to detail. Um, 
Like, if I text something that is not grammatically correct, forget a comma or misspell a word, I will hear about it every single time. <laughs> like, in some of those attributes and, 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 like, the qualities that he possesses, I have taken on as well. Like, I have a very high attention to detail. I'm very logical in my thinking and, uh, like, artistic among very many other things. But those things I got from my father. And the entire human race... Um, the, 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 the nature of sin, and this isn't even in my, in my notes, but the whole nature of sin was passed down from the first Adam. And that, that sinful nature was passed down. But Jesus was not, like his, bi- like his biological father was not Joseph, it was God. Because he was born of the Holy Spirit. So it was a new nature that was birthed in the life of Jesus. And he got his nature from God Almighty. And that sinless nature and it, it, it's through uh, it's through it, it, that per like and this is why he was able to walk sinless on this earth because he had the sinless nature of God inside of him and today how do we get God's nature inside of us through the Holy Ghost somebody somebody's paying attention <laughs> we get the the nature of God through the Holy Ghost because what are the fruit of the Spirit well, like, what is the fruit of the Spirit? It is all the, the well, at least mo- most of, or, or at least part of, the attributes of who God is. God is love. God is joy. God is peace. All, God is all the, the fruit of the Spirit. That is who God is. And when we receive his fruit, it is evidenced in our life through the fruit of the Spirit. And it's, it's like we get to take on his nature, and we overcome the nature of of sin that was birthed in Adam, and we take on that new nature, which is given through the Holy Ghost. So, I I, I just made the point that not not everyone, oh, oh, like everyone in humanity, is in a physical sense a child of God, but not everyone is living in sonship. Not everyone is living in sonship. And um, in a spiritual sense, not everyone is living as a child of God. How, how do you become a child of God in a spiritual sense? It's through the new birth experience. In John chapter 3, ver, uh, verse 5, I believe, is where it says that, oh, where, where, where Jesus was asked the question, like, how do you get born again? And Jesus was like, you get born again by being, um, uh, by being washed by, wo- or you get born of the water and born of the Spirit. And what that means is, born of the water is being baptized in the name of Jesus. And then um, being born of Spirit is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the new birth experience where we take on the nature of God. And... Um, so th- that's where the new birth happens. And then um, as I was um, going through scripture, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share Galatians 4, 1 through 7, where it talks about one of the, the biggest benefits of being a child of God. Starting in, in Galatians 4, 1. And I mean that the, that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is owner of everything which was one of those same things that the, that the older son was said, everything that you have, or everything that I have is yours. Uh, in the same way, though, everything, or though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until a date set by his father. Right now, is like, as we live for God and as we're his spiritual offspring, um, and like a spiritual child of God is like there will come a time where we pass on from this life into the other and God will turn us into rulers of entire nations. And he has placed, uh, like one of the next verses I'm going to share is he has made mansions in heaven for us. And in these things, God is already preparing a way for us. And it, it, there is a set date coming where those things will be available and unlocked for us. You just need to stay faithful and stay living for God. Uh, verse 3, and in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God set forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons, being adopted spiritually as sons of God. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This right here is the best part of the inheritance of God is getting his spirit inside of our hearts. This is, there is nothing that God has to offer that is more precious than the gift of his Holy Spirit. And it's almost like it works in our conscience as a way of confirming it's like, yes, God is, God is with me right now. I am his because I have his, his spirit, his nature inside of me. And it, with that, you can cry out, Lord, Abba, Father, help me in this situation. Um, and then I love verse 7 as well. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. <clears throat> Again, the biggest blessing of being a child of God is having his spirit in us. And when we have his spirit, we are born again spiritually into his kingdom. Or at least part of it. Receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus' name is how Jesus defined the, like, how to get into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so we don't, have, well, we don't only have to cry out to God in a physical sense as our physical father, but also we can cry out to him as our spiritual father in Cry, Abba, Father, help us in, in time of need. And he is faithful, and he will be there for you. He will comfort you when, when needed. Anything that you need, he is willing and able to provide. Um, it's not always going to be exactly the way that you request it, because sometimes, uh, like, if I request, hey, I have a million dollars, and as a loving father, he's like, that's going to ruin you. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but it, there is provision, and God shows his favor on those that are seeking him with a humble heart. Um, I already mentioned this, but uh, John 14, 2 through 3 is where uh, Jesus was talking about how there are, there are mansions that he's going to prepare for us. This is like part of that inheritance that is uh, prepared for us in, in eternal life. Um, and, and the Holy Ghost is really just an, uh, like an earnest. It, it's just like, a little bit, it's like a down payment on a house that one day we will inherit uh, the full, like be able to witness and experience the full glory of God and not just the receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost here on earth. Like, God is literally drop dead gorgeous. <clears throat> and, like, there's a reason why He hasn't shown His face to anybody yet. Because if you see Him, you would literally die. <laughs> Like, your, your spirit would be like, oh my goodness, he's so beautiful. I'd like, your, your spirit would literally leave your body. <laughs> God is drop dead gorgeous. And like, in eternity, we will get to, to worship the, the, awe, like the wonder of his majesty for all of eternity. There will be nothing like it. And, and what we have here on earth, like worshiping him here, is nothing compared to what we will have for all of eternity. And I, I'm so, I'm looking forward to, to worshiping with the saints for all of eternity. Um, and by the way, I did get that. God is dropped dead gorgeous for my dad. <laughs> Quote credit to my dad. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> he, he might be watching, I don't know. But, um, I also, uh, I, I was studying some, some scripture uh, about, like, like, what does the Bible define as being a, a child of God or a son of God? And uh, one of those is in Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So here it's like the, the children of God spiritually are those that are led by the Spirit. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So here, like, those that believe in Jesus, like an act of reliance upon God, uh, believing in him, and believing on his name, and that name is Jesus. And uh, it says that those are the children of God spiritually. Um, that the, those, the spiritual children of God are those that believe on his name. 
Uh, Galatians 3.26 also goes along with this. I didn't put it up there. But it says that you are sons of God through faith. So those that walk in obedient faith to God are, are called ch- a child of the king. Matthew 5.9 also says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Um, peace is just one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. But blessed are those that basically put the fruit of the Spirit into practice. Um, and they, they shall be called the fruit or the, the, uh, the children of God. Um, and like all, all of these things, uh, it's just like, well, what if I don't do that perfectly? Am, am I no longer a spiritual child of God? And I think that the, that the parable of the prodigal son is a good example of that. It's like, if you mess up, you turn around, and you start walking back to Jesus. And, and it's like, at no point in that story was, that, was the prodigal son referred to by his father as something other than his son. And in the same way, I, I don't think that if you mess up and you're not perfect, that you're no longer called the Son of God. Um, that, that doesn't mean that we should just go and, oh, I'm, I'm saved by grace, and I, you know I'm getting to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> let me save that for, <laughs> for a bit. Um, <clears throat> but w- w- with that, 1 John 3, 1 through 2, um, is that, and it was kind of hard to read in the KJV, so I put ESV in here. Um, in verse 1 it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so are we. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, uh, we are God's children now. And what we will be has yet uh, been appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. It's still a little bit hard to read in ESV too. But but there is like, because of the love of of the Father. The love of God is, uh, it gives us this assurance that we are children of God. That love that a father has for their children. And this, this love was demonstrated in the parable of, of the prodigal son. So, God chooses to pour out his grace, which is his favor, on those who are abiding in his house. In a physical sense, if a child was to be like, like I don't want to be called your son anymore. Like, I, I can you give me some money and go off and do their own thing? It's like the blessings and the and the inheritance and all the uh, provision is still at the house where the father lives. And what the prodigal son had to do is he went and he well he he went and spent it all. And then when he was down to absolutely nothing, he had to go back to the father's house to get to get back in right standing with God and, and to, to get that favor and that grace back into his life. It's like God, God chooses to pour out his grace on those that are abiding in his house. So it is time to get back to the house of God, back in my father's house. The, the next point that I want to make is something that God showed me about two years ago. And I've been wanting to share it for a long time. Um, and, and it's this point that the grace of God is equivalent to the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> there, I, I, I have a lot of biblical proof uh, for that statement. And I'm going to go through e- each one of them. But the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God, they are equivalent. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to for, uh, Hebrews 4.16 and start there. Um, it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Right here, it's talking about the throne of God. I mean, the throne of grace. Wait. It says the throne of grace, but it's referring to the, the throne of God. And it's like God and grace are the same thing. Um, in the same way that, that you can say God is love, you can say that God is grace. Um, and uh, we, so we can come boldly before his throne. And why? Because he is grace. In Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verse 10, it says, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit 
of grace and of supplication. And it, it, like that one, I was like, the spirit of grace. I was like, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, and, and, and the wording of that is very prophetic in, in the same way. It's like, where was the Holy Spirit poured out? On the house of David, in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. First is where it was first poured out. The spirit of grace. And then um, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it even refers to um, the capital S, spirit of grace. Anytime you see a capital S when talking about spirit, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit, and it's the spirit of grace. Why? Because the Holy Spirit and grace are the same. Um, as far as the purpose of both grace and the Holy Spirit, they are the same. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, this is one of my two favorite scriptures on grace. Um, and it starts with, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So for the grace of God, it teaches us. The purpose of grace is to teach us. What is the purpose of the Holy Ghost? It says it in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remember, remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost is a teacher. Grace is a teacher. Why? Because they are one and the same thing. Grace, by definition, is uh, G5485. I don't know how to pronounce that. But um, so some of the, the points in the definition of grace, it says uh, it's especially the divine influence upon the heart, which sounds very much so like the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Grace is a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Um, the, the, grace is, is the favor of God upon our life. The ability of God working through us, just like the Holy Ghost working through us. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31 and 33, it talks about a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit and great grace was upon them. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read that. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and there was a great outpouring of grace. Why? Because it is the same thing. Luke 2.20, uh, I think I put John 2.20, that's a correction, it is Luke 2.20. Um, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He was growing in the spirit, and uh, great grace was on him at the same time. So here, it, uh, and I was talking about Jesus there. So it, I don't know, like, does everything that I just said make sense? Like, like, like the parallel between grace and the, uh, like the operation of grace and the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. They are very, very similar. Um, and then Ephesians 2.8, which big shout out to the Bible quizzers for, uh, this is one of your, your, your memory verses, um, where it says, for by grace you are saved through faith. And what is grace? It is God. For by God we are saved through faith. And it, like, it, it's, it goes right along the same thing. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm just saved by grace. I can live however I want to. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. Um, like, and, and, and part of it is there has been a misunderstanding of what grace is. It is, grace is God. It, the work of his Holy Spirit is the same work of grace in your life that works salvation. Um, and the, the, the two, my two favorite verses on, on grace that really have brought the most revelation to me about what grace is and what it is not the first one I mentioned was Titus 2, 11 through 12. And the second one is Jude 1, 4. Or Jude verse 4 or Jude 4, whatever, however you want to mention it. Um, what it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
turning grace into something it was not meant to be. Lasciviousness is like wild living, what the prodigal son went and did. Um, the ESV uh, translate that, that, that passage, uh, perverting, uh, to pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. The NIV translates it as, pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. This is what grace is not. If anybody's like, oh, I'm just, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, I can live however I want to because God grace, God's grace will cover it. Right here, it, I, can, I can stand to say that that mindset is not biblical. Right there, there is a verse that co- directly contradicts that doctrine. And uh, it, it even goes as far to say that um, these people, they're, they're ungodly men, and they are denying Jesus Christ. The people that are operating in this way. Uh, the, 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 the mindset of operating in this way that, oh, like, uh, God's grace will cover everything. Um, and, uh, again, we do not have to be perfect, but it, it's those that are, like, willingly and going like, okay, I got my grace now I can live however I want to. That's what this verse is talking to. And that's, uh, like, like, that mindset is what that verse is talking to. Um, and e- e- even for people that do go down that path and turn the grace of God into something that it is not intended to be, which is what the, the prodigal son did, there is still a way of escape. Even for people like that, that have, like, oh, I, I turned the grace of God into something it was not designed to be. There is still... God is like, all you have to do is turn back and run back into my house and, and you, that I will over, receive you with open arms because God is a gracious God, because God is grace. It is part of his nature and he is a God of grace and mercy. And it is time to get back into the Father's house. It is time to get back into my Father's house. So let's make it personal. He is my father. He is your father. And it is time to get back in my father's house. Because it is the favor of God, the grace of God. It is given at the house of God. David was appointed king, not out in the field. He had to go all the way back to his father's house to have that anointing poured on him. And in the same way, God is wanting to pour out his favor and his grace but it is poured out at the house of God. And that's not limited to these four walls because we collectively are the tabernacle of God, the house of God, the body of God. The last passage that I I want to bring before you all today is a passage in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 25. It says, By faith, Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, which is exactly what the prodigal son went and did. And here, Moses had to make a choice. He's like, am I going to claim to be the son of, uh, of Pharaoh's daughter, or am I going to choose to be and claim that I am a son of God? In this, in this life, choosing to be a son of God is not, does not always mean that life is going to be roses and rainbows. There are going to be diff- difficult times that you have to go through, but there is a promised land ahead of us. For those that are living for God, there is an inheritance that is available and that God is wanting to pour out on his people. You just have to place your trust in him and and believe that he is willing and able to pour it out over your life. I just want to end in prayer real quick, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for the favor that you have poured upon us, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would move in a mighty way today, Jesus, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, Lord Jesus. Give us... Give us that your, your nature inside of us. Help us to live for you day in and day out and not turn your grace into something that is, was not intended to be, Lord Jesus. Help us to see that you are good and that you have provision in your house, Lord Jesus, in your physical house, and within these walls, but also wherever we go, Lord, the, the house of God goes with us, Lord. And I thank you for being with us at all times. And I pray that you would continually bless us with your grace, And let your grace go with us. Your Holy Spirit, let it go with us everywhere we go. In Jesus' name.
In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. 11.05 worship service.